Welcome to today's episode on Healing Spaces with special guest interior designer Jennifer Dowling. A reminder that this podcast is not medical advice. The intention of today's podcast is to have a fun conversation about the intersection of beauty, space, nature, health, and healing. We hope that you'll discover that nature always offers many lessons about healthy spaces and that bringing nature into your spaces helps healing and health promotion, and that you too can create an optimal healing environment at work and home. Takeaways of today's episode are hopefully to inspire you to approach space intentionally and mindfully and use it as a powerful tool for your own health and healing and to support the health and healing of all those you encounter. So this is a really fortuitous intersection of interests, if I can bring that up. Um, So recently I helped design my new pulmonary clinic using the framework of the optimal healing environment that uh, I'll talk a little bit later about today. So a warm welcome to you, Jennifer. We're so glad that you're here with us today. And uh, Jesse, how did you and Jennifer meet? So Jennifer and I met about a month ago a little more than a month ago at the physician well-being think tank that we've talked about in a couple of episodes. And Jennifer was one of the invitees who is an entrepreneur who was not a physician and didn't work in healthcare necessarily. And we had an episode about bringing outside of the box um, interests and solutions into healing and health. And Jennifer was one of those outside the box uh, solutions. And she and I both live in San Francisco, so we have that connection. But at the um, think tank, she was part of a panel talking about beauty and the impact of beauty on health and healing. And as everyone who listens to our podcast knows, I love beauty and I love things that are beautiful. And (laughs) to me, it's, it's, um, it's just a passion to bring back beauty, not as like a fluff thing, but as a really key piece of health and healing and living a meaningful and purposeful life. And so Jennifer gave this talk and it will come up again, but she said several things in her in her panel talk about space and how it could change how you feel and the work that you do. And I think I've always been an advocate for the um, changing the ugliness of medical spaces and the gray walls and the lack of color and the lack of windows and the lack of white light. And I consider myself a bit to be a plant. I need sunshine. I need windows. I need fresh air. And so to me, space is incredibly important. And I think most of our listeners also know I'm somewhat of a minimalist, but this approach of being mindful and intentional about space is very different and mindful and intentional about space promoting health and promoting healing was really just a new way of thinking about it that I loved. And so I was inspired and we spent uh, a long conversation in a van ride talking about my own space and how I'm going to be changing my blue wall to a green wall because green for me is healing and sort of the questions that she asks to get you to figure out what works for you. So I wanted to share that with um, our listeners. So Jennifer, would you be willing to tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and your background? Sure. So yes, my name is Jennifer Downing, and um, I am the studio founder of Mocha May Design Studio. We're a San Francisco-based interior design studio that focuses on well-being and wellness and space um, with a focus on bringing healing and making sure that there's dedicated space uh, within an environment for people's wellness practices, whatever that might look like. That's kind of the short version. (laughs) And to me, this idea of um, actually designing with the purpose of wellness and space is just a beautiful concept that feels somewhat new and yet is like a whole new realm of health and healing and the opportunity for us to take advantage of that many spaces haven't. I think one of the things that also came up in our conversation was that we've gotten much better in healthcare, at least designing spaces for patients and people who are sick, Mm -hmm. but not necessarily for healers. And that the space is equally important for people working in the environment, really, whether they're working in healthcare or any profession, that we should make sure that spaces work for everyone if we want everyone to perform optimally. 
And you asked a question or shared a question that you asked of a client when we were at Taravana that day that I think is just really um, inspiring and opens up the conversation about space. And so I was wondering if you could talk about that question and how people might use it to help themselves create more healing spaces. I'm sure. Um, I think it's, I think what, to your point, uh, it is critical that the healers also have that healing space that, you know, the patients, it's obviously very important that the patients have a space to heal and, you know, views to nature, but I think it's also incredibly important for the, the healers, the physicians and, and all the staff to have the same because they need to reset after the, you know, everything that they're going through within the day. But to speak to your question, um, when we start a project, one of the first things we ask our clients is where they find sanctuary and where they find wholeness um, in the world. And it can be anything. Um, and so far, every single client has come back and, and stated somewhere in nature. Um, it's usually, and it's almost always by some form of water. So it might be the ocean or a river or an alpine lake, but almost always there's a component of water and it's always been somewhere outside. So I think that's just very telling about, you know, where we need to go to heal and where we need to go to find sanctuary or restore. Uh, so we use um, the answers from this from our clients to help inform our design process. So if they say Hawaii and the black lava beaches and the bright turquoise, ocean, we're obviously going to bring color and contrast into that space. If somebody says, um, you know, Joshua tree, and we see like, you know, very organic forms and very like subdued muted colors, then we're going to use that to help inform the design of the space. So, yeah. And so that's so fun because everyone gets to be individual and it's, mm -hmm. it's a different sort of a theme, but a different way of getting at that theme that really taps into what does calm us. And I'm thinking even about like nervous system calming, because for some people, Hawaii tropics is calming for other people, Joshua tree is calming. And so knowing yourself and taking the time to listen is perhaps what that question is designed to do. Yeah, we typically ask people to like not answer right on the spot to go home and think about it. We, so we don't, I mean, maybe they, they have an immediate answer, but I want them to go home and like really think about for, you know, for a day or two, like where, where is it that if you could just like close your eyes and put yourself in a space where you feel the most whole. And I think that's like a nice uh, visual, like, where do you feel the most whole, like in your body? Um, then that feels really good. And that's what we want to pull into your space when we're designing it. The beauty of all this is that there are so many iterations of natures that yeah. um, there are these different flavors. So mm -hmm. asking your clients to go back home and think about what their favorite flavor of nature is, is such a beautiful exercise. Yeah, it's really fun too. I, you, I mean, I've learned about different spaces too and like it's fun for me to do the research when they'll name some place I've never been to somewhere in Africa and I'm like oh well like what are the colors what are the textures what are you know what are the sounds I think that's a really important one um uh so and what are the forms we're seeing because the the landscapes are so different but yeah it's really it's a really fun exercise for them and and equally for me <laughs> Teaching, how does that tie into the work you've done in your office recently? Because it's maybe a different flavor, similar approach, but different flavor. So I followed the construct called Optimal Healing Environment and wanted to share a little bit more about that because it's been written about in the medical literature. And we'll put this in the show notes, but there's a really great article about it um, that references the Samuel L. E. Institute. Um, and basically, an optimal healing environment, this term, and so therefore the acronym OHE was coined by the Samuel Lee Institute in 2004. And from this article, it's used to describe a healthcare system that is designed to stimulate and support the inherent healing capacity of patients, families, and their care providers. And so the OHE consists of not just the people, but also the people in the relationships, their behaviors, and then the actual surrounding physical environment. And that framework includes four different components that are interlinked. And so they're interconnected with each other. One being internal, so our own 
healing intention, bringing up that word intention, uh, interpersonal about relationships, behavioral with regards to healthy lifestyles. And then what we're mostly talking about here in this episode is the external healing spaces. So that's what I used for the design of the new clinic space. And it seems very much in congruency with um, what you just shared, Jennifer. Yeah, I would also add, you know, something that I took away from the Taravana um, think tank space is um, the need in space, or space I think can have a, a really big impact on how we connect with people. And so in, in preparing for that um, think tank, I had read a few articles and um, they were talking about just having taken away the doctor's lounge, for instance, or the physician's lounge and such, and that people now, now there are programs to like put two people together, but how inorganic that is. Whereas if there's a break space, people are going in and connecting naturally. And I think beyond that, in any workplace, we can build spaces for connection. And I think that's really important, whether it be just for the staff or whether it be for you know families experiencing similar things, but just an organic space to come together and connect. And the other thing that I took away that I think that I was, I felt like I was missing from my practice um, was this concept of curiosity, which I think I feel like you were starting to touch upon. Um, I think that there's something in really neatly important to wellness is that component of curiosity. And the, the major thing that I took away from the Taravana um, think tank was that I need to start incorporating some more of that into, and like, I think we can do that through space. And I think that there's like a, a really big um, component that we can, um, that curiosity is going to, to create some wellness that's just going to ex like expand out. If that makes sense. I'm cu I'm curious <laughs> about how what kinds of things could you do about with space to promote curiosity? And as as our listeners know, I'm a pediatrician, and so I think a lot about you know in in the kids healing spaces, we often have activities that mm -hmm. are are invoke curiosity. But I'm thinking also from an adult um, or a wellness standpoint, is it sort of in the art that creates curiosity? Or I'm not sure. I'm just trying to figure out like yeah. how you bring that in. I think it's, it has to do with this. So for instance, the first things that come to mind is maybe an outdoor garden space. And maybe it's um, maybe you're looking for specific things in the garden. Maybe you know when you um, when you enter a space that there's going to be 10 you know, fill in the blank objects. To, so you're just kind of keeping your eyes more open for those. Or um, maybe it's a maze. Maybe it's not just a linear hallway. Maybe it's forcing you to kind of kind of go in and out. And maybe it is through the artwork or through something else. But I I think we're 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 programmed to design for efficiency. And so when we can add just a little bit of an organic quality to a space, um, then I think it does provoke that curiosity and connection because it creates these you don't just have a destination there are time there are typically when you have something organic there's a place to to stop or to pool or to kind of sit and take something in and oftentimes those spaces will collect more than one person well and you got back to one of the things we were talking about is spaces designed intentionally yeah. and and so when we design for efficiency yes we have efficiency but we also have exhaustion and burnout and yeah. a lack of connection and potentially a lack of curiosity and so what's coming to mind here is this idea of designing spaces for mindfulness because if you think about um, mindfulness we know to be healing and we know it to um, improve focus and to improve performance and to feel better and to help our nervous systems. And so curiosity is one of the main tenets of mindfulness. And so it just was so interesting to think about it that way. And I wonder even about promoting a space that would bring in compassion, for example. I, I don't have the answer to this, but oh. self-compassion or not just yeah. compassion for others, but self-compassion or, or a space to bring in love is another one, like bringing in those kinds of colors and textures and whatever. I just, there's this, that way of thinking about it opens up a whole new way of thinking about space. If we are uh, mindful and intentional, which are my two words, living mindfully and intentionally, um, whether that's in your relationships or in your space or in how you choose to spend your time. 
And I think nature has the capacity to do that. All of those things, mindfulness, mm -hmm. self-compassion, compassion for others, interconnectedness. Um, and it is evidence-based. I wanted to share uh, from part of the article. Um, and Jennifer, when you mentioned uh, the gardens, that integrating nature through gardens or views to gardens mm -hmm. has actually been shown in the literature, in the medical literature, to reduce stress, improve the cohesion of mind, body, and spirit. So we know this, I feel like, inherently, but it's pretty cool that it's also been published on. The term uh, biophilic, when we were talking earlier, Jennifer, will you tell us more about that? Yeah, so biophilic design um, is essentially a design process that seeks to reconnect us to nature through space. And I wanted to say, so I posted something about this on our Instagram, and I just used the word connect. It, um, I said um, that it seeks to build a connection um, to nature through space. And someone commented, I think it should be reconnection. And I thought that was really beautiful and true and accurate. Um, and so it's a really nice term because it goes far beyond just like a view to the outside or bringing plants inside. Um, it's, you know, your air quality and uh, the fresh air that you breathe. It's the textures and the colors that we spoke of. And it's the materials too. Um, if you think of just like chrome and white or gray, like there's nothing about that that kind of connects our, our brain or our mind to, to nature. Whereas if you're bringing in woods and maybe some clay tones and clay, you know, like natural pigment, has an array of color. It doesn't just have to be what we think of as that terracotta um, color, you know? And so anyway, when we start to apply that to our designs, we, we're just, we're reconnecting ourselves and, and on the level in our brains that I think that, you know, we might not recognize consciously, but then when we're in this space, it just feels really good. I'm sure we've all walked into a space. I'm sure you both have just walked into a space and you're just like, oh, it feels really good. Um, and so I'm constantly doing that and I'm constantly just like taking mental notes, like what is this about the space that feels good? And almost always I can see outside. Maybe I can feel the breeze coming in from somewhere. There are usually lots of plants. There's a little bit of color. Um, it doesn't have to be color. I think color is so powerful, but even just a little bit of pigment can make a really, really big impact on a space. So like, for instance, the walls behind me might read white in the Zoom, but there's just a little bit of color and they were bright white and we, we changed them recently and it just feels completely different. Um, Anyway, but yeah, so I think that there's a, with the biophilic design, there's, there's so many um, aspects of it that when, when it's done well, it can be really impactful and beautiful and to the well-being of the space and to the people that are occupying it. Can you talk a tiny bit about texture too? Sure, texture. Yeah, so I think it's actually a design element that's often overlooked is texture. Um, and my example that I typically talk to clients about is, you know, when you're in nature, all we're, we're experiencing the color and the form, but we're also experiencing a lot of, um, of texture. So um, I think something that's really beautiful is if you think about just like a drywall wall versus like a plaster wall, there's just there's just an ever so slight texture to that, but there's something so much more appealing about the plaster wall over the kind of stark, um, just like, you know, very simple drywall. Um, well, <laughs> sorry to repeat those words, but uh, I think there's just something that's really beautiful about texture. And I do think it's something that's overlooked. Um, and I think it's a really important thing to start thinking about and bringing into spaces and um, yeah. Is, is there anything else that you want me to kind of elaborate on? I on just had never really thought about texture in a space. And so I was, I, you know, light is very obvious to me and windows are very obvious and looking at nature was very obvious and the color of a wall was obvious and maybe the furniture, but this idea of texture. And I think what is just inspires me about it is nature is full of texture. And that's really what's different between the environment we design inside and outside. And so, yes, there's maybe action and movement and breeze and air, but we can open the windows. But one thing you can't really bring in unless you do it with intention is that texture. And I'm thinking ahead too, we have our Connect in Nature retreat this weekend, which maybe we should have called Reconnect in Nature now that you said that. I actually <laughs> like that a little bit better, but that's, um, we are reconnecting and we're reconnecting to nature, but but when we are in nature and when we are really appreciating it and letting it soak in, 
noticing that texture. Like it's way yeah. better to feel a leaf too and the fuzz on it than just to look at it, for example. Yeah. And to yeah. experience it in that way. I was going to say, yeah, there's a different experience when you, um, when you said it. Yeah. If there's, you know, imagine like when you're walking past a tree, I'm, I'm like a runner. And whenever I go past like lavender or rosemary, I always like run my hand over it. And then, you know, then it's always has this beautiful smell after too, but there's just something about that texture that I think is really lovely and nourishing, um, compared to something that's just really stark, um, and so, yeah, I think when we start to bring it in and it, it can be, I would say beyond the physical texture, it could also be, um, a, a visual texture too. So for instance, you can at least, uh, basically do some kind of like mental trigger when you see like something like, a, maybe it's a wall covering or something that has a little bit of that, um, visual texture, at least your body kind of reads it to like, if I touch that, I bet that would feel a certain way. I think that there's something really, um, nice to think about that too because when you as your point when you look outside or when you are outside everything around you has both a visual and a physical texture to it yeah so that to me just really changed my thought about my space I hadn't it's a whole other layer to add in mm -hmm. and as you mentioned you can get wallpaper that's a simple way to get texture but you can mm -hmm. also start to think about it and is it like a throw pillow or is it a rug like all those really? things can have texture not just color and thinking about that as a way to nourish yourself which is one of my favorite topics is just a beautiful way and maybe part of this conversation is intention mindfully and intentionally nourishing yourself with space mm -hmm. when i when i came into the wellness space or right before i was trying to figure out what my niche was going to be and i kept coming back to the word nourishment and balance and i was like what what is this like is this can i call it nourishing design <laughs> and it just wasn't quite it wasn't quite the right word but um finally the well-being and wellness uh, you know terms came to be but prior to that it was like I just want spaces to feel really nourishing like I want when people come into the space I want it to just feel really good and it feels I want them to feel like how I feel when I step outside like I want that feeling like oh it feels so good it feels so nourishing so yeah it's a nice, it's a nice term. <laughs> I wanted to share how I brought a little bit of nature into the yes. space and how I would love to hear that. How I, um, or how me and the rest of the the lead design team um, did that in a way, and we've gotten rave reviews and excellent okay. positive feedback. So much so that the rest of the clinic building at large uh, was based off of our initial design. So we're very proud of it. That's amazing. Um, so basically the inspiration was the earth. So talking about biophilic design and thank you for enlightening me about that term. And so I was basically engaged in biophilic design without even knowing it, except that we were inspired by the earth. And so bringing in earth tones, so mm -hmm. blues and browns and the different elements in nature uh, being very intentional about adding in non-flowering plants uh, that wouldn't bother our pulmonary patients' mm -hmm. fragile lungs. Also water elements and wood, metal, and stone. So um, an easy thing that was added that the architects um, showed us was adding an installation where the lights were recessed amongst almost like a wood sculpture in the ceiling, but it was a very linear and simple uh, wood structure so that the lights kind of blended into um, the linearity of the wood, but then mm -hmm. the wood itself brought a warmth and the texture piece um, in that one functional element, but we were able to like make it all that much more by adding a design element and intention around it. Um, another example I love from our clinic space is, is our bathroom, incidentally. So, of course, the bathroom evokes some water. Um, the color of the bathroom is one that is healing, so it's a more greenish tone. And then we brought in a kind of a glossy glass um, greenish color to it. Uh, and 
we paved part of the floor of the bathroom with very organic looking stone um, so that and it was like a black stone. So there was different elements purposely brought in for a cohesive, welcoming, biophilic environment. Um, and it, it doesn't take a whole lot, but it does definitely take intention. Um, and then we also purposely, because as healthcare professionals, we're probably all too used to the very stark harshness of the fluorescent mm -hmm. light. Um, so even that toning of the light and warming that up a bit more in our clinic space was taken into account for. Uh, so there is this intentional warmth in the clinic as well. And then you throw in all the furniture and there's more curiosity and fun and texture and color that can be drawn upon there as well, uh, straight from Mother Earth. Oh, that's lovely. I love that. It sounds like such a beautiful space. If I'm down in San Diego, I'm going to come in for a tour. <laughs> yeah, I would love to take you around the clinic. That would be amazing. <laughs> I love what you brought in about warmth too, like a warm space. And one of the topics that I thought would be interesting to talk about was creating an intentional space versus maybe a minimalist space. Because I think our, in maybe it's a it's in vogue now to have a minimalist space and everybody wants to declutter. And so we were talking about purposeful spaces and intentional spaces versus just an empty white wall. And you even spoke about the paint in your room being not just white and not being not just minimalist, but using space to create warmth, for example. And maybe that space in the minimalist um experience is important because everybody, I think we all crave more space in our world and in our life, but that maybe it's more about, you mentioned somewhere, I think it was on your website, but I really liked it, virtual breathing room as opposed to like yeah. actual breathing room. And so yeah. to me that, that is maybe what minimalism is about is, is virtual breathing room or breathing room. Um, it's actually probably all the breathing room as we have the pulmonologist listening to me. <laughs> Am I saying that correctly? But but it's this idea of creating breathing room, which is something that's really important to me. And so I'm curious about your thoughts on just minimalism versus intentional spaces. And you also have other words that you use about like sustainability in space and responsibility in space and design and yeah. how you might, that's a whole lot of questions all at once, but I bet you have a cohesive way of sort of how you approach it. Yeah. So yeah, with the breathing space, so what we find is that clients generally, like if there's a wall space, they'd like to fill it. Just like, it's just kind of like a, our human nature. Like we have a space, let's put something in it. And so I'm constantly talking to people about, actually, you know what? I think that's a little, that feels like breathing room. Like, let's just leave, let's leave a little breathing room in your space. Um, and to go to, to the point of intention is, I don't want to put anything in a space that doesn't have intention behind it. If you're not going to use it, or if you don't find it beautiful, or if it doesn't evoke a memory that is really lovely, then I don't want to just, we shouldn't fill a space just to fill a space. We can, but I don't think that there's intention behind it, or there's not thoughtfulness behind it. Um, it was just yesterday having um, a conversation with my newest employee, and she was like, have you ever thought about flipping houses? And I was like, no, <laughs> because, you know, there's no intention or I'm sure there's thoughtfulness behind it, but there's like, I want to, every space should be designed for the occupant, whether it's a residential, like a, you know, two partners and a family or whether it's a hospital, it needs to be designed very specifically for what that person is there to do. Um, and so when you like flip a house, for instance, I don't know what that person's there to do. Um, so I think that's really, really important that um, that every space is thoughtful and uh, invokes the intention behind the space. Um, and then what were your other, <laughs> I know there were well, some, I guess, sustainability and responsibility. Yeah. I, so before I fell into the wellness, um, space, I was, I had a really heavy focus on sustainability and I kept being like, sustainability is a part of this, but like, it's not the whole picture. I think that there's more to this. And I, and I, I was always grappling with the word sustainability because it, I was like, well, it's sure sustainability is important, but that's just responsible, right? That's just responsible design. That that just feels, doesn't it feel like we need a term for that? There's, 
it's just respo- our responsibility as designers to pick clean materials to make sure that people are getting good air quality in their space and getting access to natural light. It feels irresponsible to do anything less. Um, so I was always struggling with the word sustainability and I was falling back into the word responsibility. Uh, so we, when we approach a space, I guess we find it, it's our responsibility to design a space that provides all these things to our client. We don't think we're doing anything special. I guess. So, yeah. I love the word responsible design and um, maybe just being responsible humans. Although yeah. I think there's a flip side to it that um, particularly physicians, but a lot of sort of type A achievers, we tend to take responsibility, take on too much responsibility. And so, um, <laughs> yeah, right. But, but designing responsibly and in, and that it is responsible to create spaces with intention that use healthy materials and help you perform your work and take better care of people and yourself, that's actually responsible. And so using the word that sometimes we use against ourselves for ourselves in this way that designing a responsible space would take into account the users, both yeah. the patients and the physicians and the anyone working in an environment and even I'm thinking about a sleep space, like, well, this space is intentionally for sleep. So you probably don't also want your office there. Um, and you don't want, I'm laughing because I'm currently, my office is in my sleep space, but only temporarily because I have a um, an extra child living at home who's borrowing a space. But but in, in with that intention that when you have an intentional sleep space, you set it up differently. And so that I think is what I wanted to bring up around the minimalism is a lot of people think it's, I have to get rid of everything. And I see it as being very intentional about having the things that help you sleep in a sleep space and having the things that um, help you eat healthy in a eating space. And so having a lot of stuff or something that someone gave you that doesn't have meaning, or maybe just the fact that they gave it to you has the meaning, but maybe you don't need to keep it. And that that is a way it strikes me, actually, uh, that's responsible design too. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't think it's, a, I'm a person, I'm not a terribly sentimental person, but like, if it doesn't, if it's not serving me mm-hmm. or my family or my office space, like I'm, I won't hold on to it. Um, and I hope that it goes to someone that will hopefully find some, some purpose with that, with the item. So I think that's really, really important to do to just kind of, and also just, and sometimes I'll just say, you know, maybe it's a picture. I'll be like, you know what? I really loved you. Thank you so much for what you brought to my space. And then I just kind of say goodbye and let it go out into the ether. Um, And I think that that's important too. That little bit of gratitude when you are decluttering uh, a space can also help with the, with the transition. Cause I think people struggle with when, I think it's really important to declutter personally. Like I'm somebody that needs to be in a space that is clean and clear. I think it helps people. I think it just helps with the general clarity of mind. I think you were getting at the idea that it's hard to get rid of meaningful items, but that if we can have express gratitude for them, it may be easier to let them go. And I often ask the question, and this might be true in any space, like there's a cost to have things in your space. Mm-hmm. And there's a cost not to. And so like, it's really just thinking about it, it, have things in your space that help you be the best version of yourself and the healthiest version of yourself and the most healed version of yourself. And, and for, as you said, what the occupants of the space are trying to do with it. Maybe that's the ultimate like responsible design is that can you with intention create a space that holds you accountable and in some way helps set you up for success with what the purpose of that space is. And so it has some relationship with energetically how you show up because of mm-hmm. the space that you set up for yourself. I think that's a nice point. I think we're also just, I think there's a scarcity mindset, um, generally speaking, in the, in America, like as in our culture. And so I think we have a really hard time saying goodbye to things too. I have so many clients that have storage units and it's like, how often are you accessing the thing in your storage? You know, it's just really hard to say goodbye to the thing. Um, and I think, yeah, going back to mindset, um, I think that there's just like this, uh, if we can say goodbye to things and just have the things that are serving us in the moment or that year or what have you. And I, I don't think it's important to just hold on to things to, to hold on to things. I don't think that they, uh, I think the mindset's really important here with the, in the scared, and to consider like, am I holding on to this? 
because it's serving me or am I holding on to this for some false pretense that I might need it in the future? Um, and I think that often people are like, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to need that in the future. And I was like, are you going to need that in the future? <laughs> and like, and, and if you do need it in the future, are you able to borrow it? Like, do you need it once or are you going to need it for longer? You know, that type of thing. I love that. And it actually gets us right to our reflection questions because those are perfect reflection questions as you're trying to declutter. Yeah. And yeah. I often add another one, which is if it, by some chance you needed it, would you be able to get it again or borrow it mm -hmm. again or find it again? As always, we like to end with a few intentional reflection questions. And today's are to reflect on space and how we can use space responsibly. So how can you create your own optimal healing environment? What makes a healing and healthy space for you? What's one thing you could change today to make just one of your spaces more healthy or healing for you and for the purpose of that space? What colors and textures are healing for you? How can you bring more elements of nature into your spaces? And what might the impact of that be? Jennifer, we tremendously enjoyed our conversation with you. I think that you have shared so many different things that our listeners uh, can expand upon and apply. Was there anything else that you wanted to share with our listeners? And Lastly, how can our listeners learn more about you and reach you? So to reach me and such, so we're on Instagram at Mokume Design Studio. That's M-O-K-U-M-E Design, D-I-S-I-G-N. <laughs> and then our website, mokumedesignstudio.com. Um, I would just leave everyone with the thought of, yeah, make sure that your space has intention within it. So if it if it makes you feel really good when you're holding the object or looking at the object, whether it's your office or your home, um, you know, then keep it and and enjoy it. Um, and I'd also just one last thing to add is I think that's really important that we dedicate space for our wellness practices, and whether that's at the office or whether that's at home. And so when we're designing spaces, we're always looking um, to make sure that if you have a yoga practice or if you have um, a meditation practice, or maybe you're into herbs, whatever it is, that if you don't have a dedicated space for that practice, you're far less likely to follow through with it. So yeah, mm -hmm. keep that in mind as you're looking at your space. That's again, the ultimate of intention. If you have a <laughs> practice and you want to do it, you really do. It's setting yourself up for a success in advance. Beautiful. So Setting the intention, speaking about intentions a lot today um, for a daily mindfulness practice is a wonderful evidence-based way to foster the internal, interrelational, and behavioral aspects of the optimal healing environment. So I hope that you'll join me and friends from mindful.org in the Mindful 30 Challenge practice with us daily in the month of September. And you can find out more at mindful.org. And consider mindful coaching as a way to clarify your intentions, declutter your mind and your spaces and your life so that you're living a responsible and intentional life in responsible and intentional spaces. Stay on after the singing bowl for our mindful moment. And if you enjoyed today's episode, we would love it if you shared the podcast and left us stars and reviews and all of those mindfully intentional things. We will see you next week. So today we're going to walk through and think about the place that brings us wholeness and sanctuary. So I want to close our eyes and take a breath. And just go there, wherever that might be for you. What does it feel like? What do you see? Is it vast? Do you feel safe? Take in what it feels like on your skin. Is there a breeze? Do you feel the warm sunlight on your skin? 
What do you see when you open your eyes? What are the colors? Think about the forms. Are they soft? Are they rigid? Take in those colors for a moment. What do you hear? Do you hear birds, the breeze, a river, waves? Take in those sounds for a moment. What do you feel? Are you standing? Are you sitting? Are you laying down? What do you feel underneath your body? What time of day is it? Is it the afternoon or the first thing in the morning? Take that in for a moment. Take the light in for a moment. Is that light warm? Can you feel the light? Take the whole space in. Enjoy the texture. Enjoy the peace. Enjoy the wholeness in this moment. <laughs>